Good afternoon. I am thrilled to uh, be with you here today to celebrate my inaugural solo exhibition. My name is Austin Buckingham. I'm a Gallery Route One artist member. The title of the exhibition is A Life Without Design is Erratic. The quote from the Stoic philosopher Seneca refers to the trajectory of our human existence. I also take its meaning to apply to, to the life of an art object which the artist has brought into being. The word design has two definitions. Design is a plan or specification for the construction of a system. Or design is an arrangement of lines or shapes created to form a pattern or decoration. This exhibition is about the latter in that we are designing our environment by choosing the objects we surround ourselves with. I moved to California from Colorado. I describe my life in Colorado as par parched, dry, constrained, and small. In California, I feel the lushness of life, vegetation, water, and the freedom I've always craved. I find that the art I produce in California is radically shifted from the art I produced in Colorado. This exhibition reflects that shift, which I think is influenced not only by my proximity to ocean and river environments, but also the unique California design and architecture. This exhibition is inspired by the work California Design, 1930 to 1965, Living in a Modern Way. <clears throat> this book, which I brought with me today, is the product of a 1912 Los Angeles County Museum of Art exhibition by the same name. <clears throat> For this exhibition, I've used the principles of design to create these artworks. I've also used this exhibition as an opportunity to push myself artistically in new directions. And, um, I will describe those uh, artistic new directions as we tour the artwork. <clears throat> this uh, series that um, is being filmed up close right now is informally called Homage to Ruth Asawa. The backstory is that um, I read the Sunday New York Times obituaries because I'm interested in the luminaries and uh, their lives that have passed. In uh, August of 2013, I found an obituary of Ruth Asawa who had died. Um, this was the first time I heard of Ruth Asawa and it prompted me to do a lot of research about her life and the works that she created. And if you're familiar with Ruth Asawa's work, you will note that she uh, does these incredible, uh, beautiful uh, three-dimensional wire sculptures that are held in um, important collections around the country, such as the Guggenheim, the Whitney, the de Young, um, and uh, quite a few years ago, I visited Black Mountain College where Ruth Asawa studied under Joseph Albers at the alternate um, art school that was located outside of Asheville, North Carolina. Um, I did a pilgrimage there, kind of hoping that I might somehow be inspired by her. And this was actually before I started doing uh, monotype printmaking. So these uh, four series of works, which are untitled one, two through five, are really my attempt to translate her three-dimensional works into two-dimensional form. This particular work is uh, one of the ways in which I try to extend myself artistically. This is one of the largest pieces that I've ever created. It measures 120 inches. It is a, a triptych, and I chose to present this piece mounted on wood panel. So the scale of it was uh, uh, a challenge for me, mounting 
paper of this size on wood panel was incredibly uh, technically challenging. And then the other challenge for, challenge for me was the color green. Uh, I've always had difficulty with green. I just find it a little bit overbearing and too loud. And so I challenged to use green as a primary color in this particular uh, triptych. This work is for me is inspired by uh, Alexander Calder and um, Victor Passmore, two artists that, that I admire. This next series of three prints, I have a triptych, uh, a single print, and then another triptych. I informally refer to this work as the swimming pool series. Um, since I've been in California, I am enchanted with all things water from the river environment to the ocean environment. I started uh, year-round lap swimming at a really lovely little pool in Sebastopol, and I love feeling that immersion of my body body and the sensory um, perceptions of swimming what I and what I call blue sapphires. So these three works are inspired by the watery environment of uh, Western Sonoma County and also by lap swimming. Trying to find a way to translate that quality of shimmery blue water into um, artistic representation. You know, something that I might point out on this particular image is uh, these prints, this triptych is I use uh, stamps sometimes on, uh, on the print work. Um, so here I used a small rectangular eraser actually and just stamped directly onto the paper with uh, silver ink um, using the eraser and just going tick, 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 tick on, on the paper. This last series I call Black and White Study. Um, this is uh, in, inspired by my fundamental artistic origins, which is in black and white film photography, as I have uh, attempted to translate my love of black and white film photography onto printmaking. I like the spare aesthetic of the black, white, and gray scale. And uh, these, these prints are my representation and interpretation of uh, that inspiration. And this final work um, is inspired by Ellsworth Kelly, whose uh, very graphic work I uh, really admire. I chose to challenge myself by doing a gridded quadditch, quadditch meaning a four uh, piece panel. And the uh, challenges with a quadditch is of course, I'm having to work in multiple dimensions. So not only does each piece need to line up in the grid, but then diagonally the pieces and the lines um, need to line up in order for it to, uh, to have a cohesive look. And I mounted um, the paper on wood panel. Um, thank you very much for joining me today on the exhibition of uh, my um, first solo show. And I look forward to seeing you at the gallery. And please uh, come and visit us in person. We are open with these three exhibitions through May 22nd. Thanks so much. Have a great day. Right. And let me just uh, stop right here and, and mention, I think some people have questions about what is a monotype. 
It is a printmaking uh, process. And if someone is, has a particular interest, I'm more than happy to go into that in more detail, perhaps later um, after the, the annex um, discussion. Um, but for now, it's a, it's a monotype uh, printmaking process. It does use an etching press, and the works are on paper. Um, these four works right here, so this is untitled two, three, four, and five, are inspired by Ruth Asawa. And as I understand in Japanese, you don't put any emphasis on the syllables, so I hope I'm pronouncing her, her name correctly, Ruth Asawa. Um, I, regu I regularly read the, the Sunday New York Times obituaries because I'm interested in the, the luminaries and their lives that have passed. And as it happens, in 2013, I read the obituary, which I still have, of Ruth Asawa. And I didn't know about her before. I was living in Colorado at the time. And I was immediately drawn to the story of her life and her work. And it set me off on a, a path of visiting um, her collections where I could find them. And they are all over the place. They're in the, the, the Young, uh, the Whitney, the Guggenheim, just to name a few. Um, and also in the Asheville Museum um, in North Carolina. Um, I, I went to Asheville and saw her collection there. And also not far from Asheville is the Black Mountain College, where she went to the alternate uh, Art, art school that was headed up by Joseph Albers. So I kind of did a little bit of a pilgrimage there. So this was, you know, years before I even um, took any, um, had any classes or any knowledge about printmaking and monotypes. Uh, but yet I held on to this for all those years and I bought this book and I saved it. And now what, um, I find is that that research that I did about her life has found its way into the influence of my work. Um, what I am uh, tried to do here was to translate her three-dimensional works into a, a two-dimensional form um, using the monotype as the technique. Also what I'd like to point out about these particular works is um, monotypes, like most uh, forms of art, has some limitations that you bump up you bump up against, and then you try to figure out, well, how can I overcome that? Uh, for monotypes, making a, a single line is very challenging. And um, what I have begun doing is using charcoal or graphite or India ink or sometimes stamps directly onto the, the paper. So here I've used um, charcoal to create these shapes here. Um, here, um, India ink, and for me, these reference a, sem uh, a semic language. A semic language is not really language. It just maybe seems like it's, it's a language. It has that appearance that causes you to wonder, is that saying something, and I'm just not understanding it. Um, but I like the use of a semic language because, um, well, actually, I don't really know why, but... <laughs> But I like it because of the, uh, the, the quality of uh, the, the single line onto the print. And maybe for me, it imparts a mystery that perhaps I'm feeling. And I think that also imparts a mystery to, to those that look at, <clears throat> at the work. Over here, I used uh, graphite uh, directly onto these prints. And these are uh, graphite shapes. And uh, finally, over here on this, we're still in the uh, homage to Rudasawa, is what I call this particular um, series. Um, I used graphite on here. And then for these shapes right here, I just used a bottle top. And I used it as the bottle top as a stamp, and then just stamped directly onto the, the, the paper. This is uh, Untitled 6. It's a triptych. It measures uh, 120 inches on a wood panel. A wood panel, uh, use, utilizing wood panel as a presentation is something that I experimented with specifically for this exhibition. Um, it's something that I wanted to explore and I decided I am going to use this, uh, this exhibition as an opportunity to uh, catapult myself over the resistance of uh, utilizing wood panel. Um, so I'm, I'm adhering paper directly onto to wood panel. Um, this 
uh, triptych measures 120 inches, which is the largest piece that I've ever um, created. Um, each of these panels are 20 by 40, which really pushes the physical limits of the, the etching press. Um, two other things that I tried to uh, confront with this particular triptych is the color green. Um, for me, green is just very challenging. I, uh, to me, it's very loud and very uh, dom domineering in the artwork, and so I really rarely use green, but here it figures prominently because I wanted to get myself uh, comfortable with green. And also, this particular uh, a triptych is inspired by uh, two artists that I admire, um, um, Alexander Calder and Victor Passmore, and so I was trying to use a more minimalist uh, approach. And um, all my prints are untitled, but I have a a series title for them. So the series title for these, collectively, I call the Swimming Pool Series. Um, since I moved to California, water figures prominently in my artwork and also in my life. I lap swim several times a week. I'm totally enchanted with the sensory experience of a buoyancy and swimming in the sapphire blue waters of the pool. I just, you know, I just feel so nourished and enriched by the experience. And I forgot to pick up this book. Could you grab that for me, Ellen? Thank you. Um, so I have been exploring how can I depict uh, water and that feeling of blue, of swimming in, in that beautiful blue sapphire water. And as it turns out, David Hockney also had a, a, a series of uh, a swimming pool uh, paintings that he did. So I brought this book because I um, looked at his work as I was trying to explore uh, swimming pool. Thank you. Here that comes. Um, the swimming pool series. The the final three works I call the black and white study. Um, I started my artistic career thinking I was going to be a black and white film photographer, which seemed to sort of uh, flatlined and disappear before my eyes. And uh, but I still love the uh, the aesthetic of the the black white grayscale and these three prints are my attempt to translate black and white grayscale film photography into uh, the printmaking monotype medium. This one, this was a, also a new experiment for me. I've never done a gridded piece this large. And uh, the challenging aspect of this was just trying to figure out the logistics of having everything um, match up. And if you've ever done a gridded piece, you know that that can uh, can be uh, difficult, and it was difficult. <laughs> yeah, I want to just to finish uh, right here and say that Will uh, Tom's helped me. Actually, he hung the work. I helped him um, hang the work, and Will just did uh, a beautiful job. And I really appreciate you, Will. Thank you. Uh, if someone had questions about the monotype process, I did bring some props to, to um, show because I think it does need a prop in order to fully appreciate and understand it. This is the, a picture of the, the etching press, uh, very similar to, to the one that, that I use. And this is the etching press that you know, printmakers use in order to create a, a, a print. And let me just say that you know, monotype, the mono and monotype means one. So each, each monotype is unique and original. There's no additions or um, reproductions or copies. And when I say print, it's not a Xerox print or some other kind of uh, non-original print. It means that the print was created on uh, the printmaking press or the etching press. That's why it's called a print. Yes? You mentioned that if someone had used charcoal or, or ink, did you do that after the printed printed, or was it part of, it went through the press? Um, some of them did go through the press. Uh, the the uh, problematic part, especially charcoal, is in order to create a print, the paper has to be 
saturated or made wet, and so there has to be some care given. And I've actually made this mistake, is uh, if you put charcoal on the paper and you're still printing, then that charcoal will just float right off the paper and it floats away. So for the charcoal specifically is the very last thing that I do. I find it so joyous, like music, like, but not, not Bach. <laughs> thank you you know i i do think well i do think of it as musical in fact i i used the i described it as music in that you know it has has pace um you, you feel like the space stretches out a little bit and you, there's also a place for uh, i'm calling it silence that you can rest within so um I like a feeling of spaciousness in the work, and um, when you think of music, you think of the pauses in the work so that you can just kind of rest in that space. And I, as a matter of fact, I did use music to describe the work. Do you work to music? No. Do I work to music? No, I work to, and I work to NPR. Um, this is our visiting artist uh, exhibition, and it is a two-person collaborative exhibition. Dottie Saichan lives in California. Anita Toivio lives in Finland. And they met at the Venice Biennale and uh, have been collaborating for, I think, 13 or 14 years now. So some of the work here is by both of them, and some are in pieces by individuals. I'll try to point out to you. This is a collaborative piece, and very subtly, it's a projection onto, you know, it's a, it's it's water seas projected on trees. That's uh, I think that's the keynote of this uh, show. Um, Dottie's work is mostly in this space. They are, uh, you can see these are digital prints. And um, I was just talking to someone here and uh, the, the quality of this work um, makes me feel that it is an elegy to vanishing forests, dying trees. Etc. So it's very beautiful, but it's also sad. And then uh, Anita's work is in this area. She has done these uh, driftwood pieces with an extruded non petroleum plastic that is supposedly um, will, will degrade over time and using driftwood. So here we have the sea, there we have the tree in these. And then I think these three drawings here are collaborative pieces and they show how the two artists uh, can work together. The photograph is by Dottie and then Anita <clears throat> has made these drawings so that they, you know, it's, it's interesting because they work together and yet they are distinct. Um, if you have questions. Did she tell you anything, did she tell you anything about um, the choices that she used for filtering her uh, photographs? She did not, she okay. did not. Um, I, what I think is interesting is that you know, this is an exhibition about the environment and degradation of the environment. However, the artists are using high-tech uh, stuff like, like this kind of photography and printing. Mm -hmm. And they fly between Finland and California. I mean, you know, that's the irony of our situation right now. Mm -hmm. So how often do they, they meet and to collaborate or they just do it virtually? No, they online. they work okay. together. They they I know they had at least one residency together. Okay. Yeah.
Hi, I'm Nicole Irene Anderson. I'm the fellow at Gallery of Route 1 for 2022 through 2023. Um, this is my exhibition. It's called um, Unspoken Thing, um, which takes you to the first painting, um, which is titled Unspoken Thing. Um, I painted this during um, last year. Um, and it's part of my series where um, I did a lot of traveling during the pandemic and taking photographs and just doing research walks. And um, so I had this collection of um, photographs, which I um, proceeded to make paintings out of. Um, and a lot of my focus with it was to really just kind of isolate on one small event and kind of explore the color um, possibilities. Um, a lot of my work is um, very large and drawing based. So I, so these um, small scale paintings were really meant to be a kind of a micro focus on something. Um, In a lot of these works, I wanted to get the stillness of the time, the, uh, the world kind of without people, um, the stillness, and in some of them, the, the, a little bit of the solemn, solemn feeling of the world. And um, I also just wanted to just portray a sense of calm. Um, with these works. And this work is, um, in a way, similar process, but I, I painted it two years ago, and it's a drawing and a painting. Um, the drawing is over um, casein. Um, it's like a milk protein-based paint. And so there's this very intricate gra graphite drawing, as you can see, and um, parts of it are um, painted with oil. And part of the reason I did this was just to kind of play with the, the time passing of it and like the there's like this kind of historical I think feel with the graphite pencil and then you kind of have this like feeling of now um, and uh, in the in the painting and so there was this kind of dip, this uh, play between stillness and kind of the motion and um, also, it's just, in a way, it's kind of like a film still, is how I think of it. Um, we kind of have this one character in the center, who's this lone figure. And to me, it's, it's kind of like this sort of play on like the individual, individualism and like in the, in the West and those, those ideals. And then this is coming back to the pandemic series.
is my exhibition. I look forward to you coming at the at the Gallery Route One and coming by and seeing it. The opening is uh, this Saturday. So there's a piece that's on the, the back wall here, and I'm gonna start with that one, um, which I made in 2019. And um, it's made, it's a mixed media piece. Uh, it's um, kind of a landscape based work in um, casein paint, um, graphite drawing, and then there's oil paint um, as well, like in the sky and in some of the other forms. And um, it's, it's kind of just, cinematic in a way where you're kind of in this it feels like a, a movie set sort of where there's kind of this this lone character that's like walking behind the the trees and um it's kind of like in the this and the theme that i was working with was uh this the kind of like very the beauty and the the romance of like the western kind of landscape and this idea of manifest destiny and then the kind of the, the things that are kind of funny about it, like the idealization of, of the individual taking on and solving their own problems. And um, so it's also, you know, there's kind of a humorous aspect and a dark aspect to it as well. Um, and I decided to use the different mediums because I wanted, I feel like the drawing has a very um, uh, cerebral and slow nature to it. And then pairing it with oil painting gives it movement, gives it this this energy. Um, so I so you're kind of getting this interplay between um, slow and fast, um, which I think is kind of an interesting dynamic. So then that work kind of takes me into these um, smaller paintings, which I which I began after I made that work. Um, and it was, it was something I started during the, uh, the pandemic. And it was after I had a show at the Museum of Sonoma County where I had these very large drawings that I was exhibiting. And so I wanted to do something that was focused, something that um, really started to delve into painting, oil painting itself. And um, you know something that was much more pared down than I had previously done. And so that's where that work comes from. So I did a lot of um, traveling, um, like driving around and taking these walks by myself because it's the pandemic. And what, I had my camera, so I was taking lots of pictures. I did some sketches. And there's just certain things that resonated to me on just an emotional, just purely an emotional level. Um, and then I take these back to the studio and you know, I decide when I'm going to paint there. And so they were kind of, they were really just a focus of color, um, the mood, um, I think just the energy of, of the times that was going on. And also I was thinking about them as a way that would get me to other works as well. Um, other work that was potentially larger or, you know, another series that could, that, that could come about of them. So, so in that way, they're sort of like a, a bridge to my next work as well, um, which kind of takes me into this painting. Um, which is um, oil on linen. Um, it's called Unspoken Thing. Um, and this painting is, um, I think it has a lot to do with loss in a way and this the sadness of the pandemic and like losing someone. And um, also I did it during you know the riots and the whole like, the architecture of the the, um, the pillars and this, you know, very, you know, I would say uh, Western, you know, type of architecture to me and just this like very stark neutrality to it just kind of spoke to that, that moment for me. Um, so that about sums up this little exhibition. Um, thank you. And I'm looking forward to what happens next with here at Gallery Route 1. Thank so you. My, my question is, you said that this, this building, unspoken thing, mm -hmm. um, you, you said references, I don't know, Western architecture? Is that what you're yeah, saying there? No, you know, when I see it, I, I think of, uh, oh, that's okay, I'm good. Uh, when I see it, I think of Southern colonialism mm -hmm. and, you know, plantation estate, uh, especially when you were talking about the riots 
it, for me, referenced slavery. <laughs> and, um, and of course, it's a white structure, so I don't know if, if that was perhaps an unconscious thought. I don't know. Do you have any thoughts about that? Nicole, I mean. <laughs> I just put my middle name in there because Nicole Anderson's too common. Um, no, but thank you for that. Um, yeah, and you know, talking about you know white white culture, white architecture, which yes, the plantation and it's it's that idea of the pillars and the steps and that that sort of like you know you're looking over somebody, and that to me was not I didn't. It's not like the, the riots happened and then the building was in there. I was like already working. I was already working on it. And I would say in general, um, architecture that is, I would like boring and utilitarian and things that are used for industrial purposes or for like administrative things, like those things to me are kind of, for some reason they're appealing to me. I think this the, uh, the idea that like, of like authoritarianism and like is very like the fear of it to me is something you know it is something that like comes up now and then it's something I haven't quite I don't know if it shows my work quite yet but it's something that I think about um but to me like this sort of you know what accumulated it wasn't just the the riots it was like everything that was you know going on to me I just felt like the color needed to be pared down. There was just something, I mean, the title unspoken thing, it's like something that's hard to define, but it's there. It also menacing. And it's menacing. Yes. And it's sad, you know. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, thank you for noticing that. Any did other questions? Say, Nicole, did you say, um, was that from a photo? Or you can no, I did. Uh, yeah, so all of, all of my work, um, it does come from things that I've seen. So you did see and so I take pictures and and I recompose them a bit. I obviously there's a lot of color changes and things like that that happen. But I I need to I really admire artists who can just come up with things, you know, in their mind. But I'm not that way. I really need to come in contact with something in order to work off of it. And you know, it just really was yeah. an impact. It's so such it a did. Strong. And and other thing too that that. There was something about the swing sets being so tall. It seemed dangerous. And there's little things like that to me yeah. that can be like, you know, impact you in, at the mo in the moment. And, you know, obviously there's, you know, bigger implications possibly because it's art and that's what you do with it. Um, but, but it started sort of there. That's just the feeling of danger. You, you really get it across. And Good. what you were saying about industrial art, one of their yeah. shadow across it on this wall mm -hmm. that has that feeling to it. I mean, it's just really mysterious to me. Yeah. And I know it's so beautiful, this color, but it's cold. Yeah. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Thank you. 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 Thank you.